Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a, another edition of the Ocho and Ortiz Disney podcast. On this episode, it's review time again. What are we reviewing? We'll find out in a minute. Let's get this thing started. Buddy Josh, how are you doing? I'm doing good, man. How are you? I am surviving, my friend. I am surviving. Yeah, I mean, aren't we all, right? <laughs> as best as we can, right? Like, in, in this climate right now? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, I guess I'm working. You know, it's, it's, it's fun. I'm still unemployed at the moment, but it is what it is. True. I can it's only okay. do so much. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I should get a little bit of time off, I guess, right? Yeah, I, I can't. Com well, I mean, I can complain about that because I have, uh, I have no money. I have no money. Well, that's not true. I'm, I'm getting government income, which is actually pretty sweet. Yeah, that's true. But you know, but I, I, I don't like living off the government. You know what I mean? Like, if the sooner I don't have to rely on government money, the happier I'll be. Yeah, it's true. I get it. The sooner we're allowed to travel, I'll be happy. Yeah, that's uh, that's going to be an interesting one. I know we were going to try to redo Disney in the fall, but it looks like we might have to postpone it th at this point until next year. Well, fuck all that noise. As long as it opens up, I don't give a fuck I'm going. A hundred percent. As long as things are open, I'm gone. I don't care. <laughs> I am gone. You're, you're, you're gonna be. You're gonna end up like the guy that was arrested the other day for for camping out no, in no. one of the resorts. <laughs> no, I. I mean, if, as long as it's open, then I'm going. Right. <laughs> as long as Disney is open, then I'm going because I. It better be open. I will be really, really sad and pissed off if it's not open for the Halloween stuff because this is supposed to be the. If I'm right, this is the 30th anniversary or 30 years of uh, Halloween Horror Nights at Universal Studios and I've never been for the, one of the hollow, for the um, anniversary show years. I was supposed to go for the 20th one 10 years ago and then fucking White and bailed on me last minute. <laughs> what? Like he White, always does. White and bailing on a trip last minute? That's so unlike him. That you know that is literally the, that was the final straw of me waiting for him to go on vacations and that is when I 100% started going on vacations by myself after that. I was like, I'm not waiting on you anymore, fucker. I'm fucking going. I'm booking shit. That is one of the reasons why I go by myself all the time because I don't wait for anybody. If they want to come, they can come. If they don't, well, and that that's why I've started going on vacations on my own too. Like after after the incident a couple years ago where I was supposed to go to New York with him, uh, I was just like, all right, I'll I'll invite him, and if he wants to come, he can come. But I'm just going to make reservations for myself, and if I have to change anything last minute, I'll do what I have to. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? So that was supposed to be 10 years ago, and then I missed the 25 one because... Why didn't I go to the 25? Oh, because I was dating Ange at the time, and because she couldn't go, she didn't want me to go. So yeah. But So this is supposed to be the 30th year, and I'm supposed to go to that fucking thing, and I'm going to be really mad if they don't do it. Well, hopefully they will, but... Yeah. But we are here today to do another movie review. Yes. And I I asked off I asked off the top what we're reviewing, and anyone that's going to be <laughs> watching, watching the, the video, video podcast of this is already going to know because the picture is in the background. Yeah. But... <laughs> I didn't want to say anything when you were saying it because I don't talk during your intros, but I was just like. Um... I forgot. I forgot. I didn't change that because normally I have the Ocho and Ortiz uh, logo up in the background when I do the intro, and then I switch yeah. to what we're talking about. And you have it. You changing your Skype profile picture to our logo, which I love, by the way, has just like completely thrown me off. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I told you like I was gonna do it, and I, today I actually decided, oh, I should probably go do that. But, Sorry. so, we, we are going to be talking about the 2010 
Disney movie Secretariat based on a true story of the real life Triple Crown winning horse. And before we get started, do you want to do you want to give your initial thoughts on the movie, Josh? Yeah, it was it was good. I had no idea what the hell it was about. Never seen it before. Never even I mean I saw the previews for it when it came out, but I had no interest of seeing it. Uh, but it was good, better than I thought it was going to be. So I'll I'll let you in on a secret. So originally I was all excited because a a buddy of mine had suggested that we do Rookie of the Year, and I was all for doing Rookie of the Year. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Because I sort of got like a, a cutoff sound and and I wasn't sure if you were still there or not. But I'm, I'm here. If you ever hear that, it's probably just me uh, muting my mic. Oh, okay, okay, okay. That, that's fair. Yeah. So oh, sorry, my sister walked in. <laughs> hi, Ava. He says hi. So you, you, you say hi. I'm gonna say that again, though. Oh, she. I heard that. <laughs> she heard that. She wants you to say it again. Hi, Ava. Thank you. <laughs> That's better. It's because I mispronounced it the first time. It's 100% because I mispronounced it the first time. <laughs> that, that's exactly what it was. Because she just kind of had this like, oh my god face. <laughs> See, here's here's where I get fucked up. Because your sister pronounces it Ava. Yeah. My cousin named her daughter Ava. So I, I it, it fucks me up. Gotcha. So, uh, yeah, no, to totally that's why she, she made me re-say re it, so I could pronounce it uh, the correct <laughs> way. <laughs> well, I mean, at least you knew what it was, and you didn't have to, uh, she, she didn't have to correct you, you know? But, like I was saying, originally, this was going to be uh, a review of Rookie of the Year, because my buddy suggested it to me. I didn't realize that Rookie of the Year was a Disney movie. And my buddy's like, well, I, I've seen it on Disney Plus. So I checked it out and it is indeed on Disney Plus. However, upon further research, it was originally a Fox movie, which mm. is one of those ones that Disney has acquired over the years. So I'm like, okay, technically it's Disney property now. But we're still too early on in this podcast where I don't want to get into Disney acquired properly, property. I still want to focus right now on Disney original produced content. So I want to switch it up. But after he suggested Rookie of the Year, I'm like, okay, well, now I just really want to find a Disney sports movie. And Mighty Ducks and Cool Runnings were the first, oh. two, were the first two that popped into my mind. And then... Mm -hmm. As I was going through, I saw Secretary, and I remembered watching this movie a couple years ago, like when it when it was first released in. I didn't see it in theaters, but I saw it when it was released on DVD. So I don't think I saw it right away. It probably would have been 2011, 2012. So it's been about eight or nine years since I watched it, and I remember enjoying watching it at the time. And rewatching it, I liked it. I, I still enjoyed it. But there are a lot of historical inaccuracies, which we'll get into. For time, because I am trying to condense these reviews, so we're I'm trying to keep them within the 40 to 50 minute range. So mm -hmm. for time, there's probably going to be smaller insignificant scenes that I'm going to skip over. But without further ado, let's get into Secretariat. And, I mean, I have notes written down, but Josh, feel free to jump in <laughs> at any point if you have anything that you want to say or add. So, All right, hopefully I remember. <laughs> so the movie starts with a biblical reference, a biblical quote. I'm not sure what the reference was. They may have put it up on screen and I wasn't paying attention. Yeah, um, when you, as soon as I started that movie, I was like, fuck Dave, what are you making me watch? <laughs> <laughs> but don't worry, it... it, it it gets better for the non-religious people out there. It's not a movie based on religion. So the opening scene is set in the Tweety household at dinner time. And the lead character, played by Diane Lane, Penny, Penny Tweety, or Penny Chenery. She goes by both in this movie. She went by both in real life, too. Her maiden name was Chenery. Her married name was Tweety. 
So just to sort of get that out of the way and get that sorted out, that's why she goes by Tweety and Chenery. So Penny gets a call, and we find out in the next scene that her mom has passed away, which leaves just her father taking care of the Chenery farm, which was a farm that owned and raced thoroughbred racehorses. Uh, but they had fallen into some financial trouble because the horses hadn't been doing too well. Uh, Penny's father was in ill health, and because he was the main owner of the horses, he was, like, not really taking as good of care of them. He wasn't selling them at the proper prices when people were inquiring, acquiring about the horses. He was selling them for, like, below value of what they were worth. So he wasn't making as much money as he could. And so in the end, he ended up basically having to owe a lot more money than what the horses were making him. So after after the scene where we find out that Penny's mom has died, and I do just want to say that a lot of these scenes are very quick cut. Like rewatching this movie, I didn't realize like how quick cut the scenes are. Like each, I don't think there's a scene that lasts... Uh, Outside of the outside of the final scene at the Belmont Stakes, I don't think there's a single scene that goes more than like 20 minutes. Each scene seems to be about 30 seconds to a minute before it cuts to the next scene. It's a really fast cut movie, but it's it's still really well put together. I thought. Yeah, no, it was it was good. I liked it. Uh, her, the guy who plays her dad, I've seen him before in. Um... Uh, he was in Daredevil, the TV, the Netflix show. Oh, okay. I never saw the Netflix one. Oh, it was, that one was much better than the the um, Ben Affleck movie. I remember. Right? I remember watching the Ben Affleck and uh, movie with. I pretty sure it was White, and it had to have been White, because he was the one that I went to the movies with all the time back in the day, yeah. and I remember about like fifteen twenty minutes into the movie, like. It was just so bad, and I remember shouting out, Jesus, I'm missing Celebrity Apprentice for this? And I actually got a few laughs from the theater. Uh, that's, that's, that's pretty funny. You know the best thing about that movie was? Well, that was like the introduction of Evanescence. Because Bring Me to Life was like the song for that, that movie, right? Fair, fair. Yeah. So... We have a quick scene at the house. I guess it's sort of the viewing for Penny's mom because in the next scene, it's it's still at the house, but it's Penny alone with her dad and she's talking with her dad and this is sort of where they establish that he's he's has onset Alzheimer's. He can't really remember things. Uh, maybe a little bit of dementia as well. Again, this one's a quick scene before they quickly cut to the cemetery where they're burying Penny's mother. And then that cuts to a scene with Penny and her brother discussing their father's aforementioned uh, dementia and Alzheimer's and whether or not he should be in a nursing home. They also discuss the possibility of selling the farm slash horse ranch penny's brother hollis wants to sell it but penny wants to keep it and try to maintain it and try to get it into better shape to uh to sell the horses for the value that they're worth instead of just selling things off for the sake of getting money for it we then cut to a scene in the barn with one of the trainers or I guess at that point it was the trainer talking about where Penny had found out that her mom had to cancel a sale of a couple of the horses because again her dad was trying because of his dementia was trying to sell the horses for below value and Penny's mom wouldn't let him so she ended up canceling the the, the sale the sale and then Penny confronts the trainer because it should have been the trainer that stopped her father from doing it because the trainer knew the value of the horse is better than anyone. But it turns out that the trainer, I guess, was working at another farm and he was trying to acquire those horses for the other farm at a cheaper price. So 
Henning basically fires him and threatens to have him arrested for like, I can't remember the term, but basically the equivalent of insider trading. But this this scene also esta- helps to establish Penny as a tough businesswoman who's not going to take shit from anybody. We then go to a scene at a gentleman's club, and no, I don't mean a strip club. I mean, like, back in the day when you had clubs just for men, and it was like a drinking and smoking type place where you would go play cards, eat, um, and basically just relax. And so Penny talks to, I guess, another horse owner at this club. Um, I can't remember the name of the gentleman she talks to, but she ba- she's basically trying to inquire about getting a new trainer for the farm stable. And so he suggests that Penny gets Lucien Loring, which then again, another very quick cut scene, cuts to Lucien playing golf, sort of being an abrasive dick on, on the golf course, but also it's John Malkovich playing this character, so it's goddamn hilarious. <laughs> and Lucien says that he doesn't want to work for Penny, not because that not because she's a woman, but because trainers work on commission, and right now her stable doesn't have any good horses that are going to make money. So why is he, basically he's saying, why is he going to waste his time being a trainer when he's not going to get much out of it because her horses are basically uh, valueless? Yeah, I didn't know uh, John Malkovich was in this, so that was kind of a a little nice surprise when I saw him because I I think that guy's hilarious. Yeah, John Malkovich is fucking amazing. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was recently listening to another podcast that was reviewing Secretariat, and they were talking about how surprised they were that John Malkovich managed to get the French accent down. And I'm thinking, he's playing a character from Quebec, and I maybe it's because the people that were doing the podcast were, I guess, Americans. But being a Canadian from Ontario, I'm like, I didn't, I could not detect any hint of a Quebecois accent in John Malkovich. It was basically just John Malkovich talking as John Malkovich. I will give him credit. He picked up he picked up some French phrases that uh, he uses in this movie, but as far as the accent goes, there was hardly any accent from what I could tell. There was an accent? <laughs> uh, apparently. Apparently, according to this other podcast. but uh, Yeah, I didn't, I didn't hear no accent. I didn't hear no accent. I just heard John Malkovich being John Malkovich. Yeah, being John Malkovich and speaking in French. Sometimes. Yes, That's it. yes. We then get information on this coin toss which Penny's father had been doing for uh, a couple of years with another owner named Ogden Phipps. And so they give us a bit of background on the coin toss, as well as a montage, a mini montage of Penny sort of doing her research on it. And basically the way the film explains it is that basically the coin toss Because a lot of people put value on the male horses after they're done racing and put more money on on breeding the male horses to, to get their offspring. But basically the way it was explained in the movie is that Penny's father realized that, you know, the male horse only made half of the horse, right? Like you still had, it still took the mare, the female horse, to, to make the baby so her father essentially put more emphasis on the female horses and basically the way it came across explained in the movie at least the way i interpret it in the movie is that they did a coin toss every year and whoever won the coin toss got their pick of female horses that they were going to breed that's the way it came across to me in the movie Upon doing further reading on Wikipedia, this is actually what I end up ended up finding out about uh, this stipulation. So, in 1965, Chenery, Penny's father, entered a full sharing con- uh, agreement with Ogden Phipps, who owned a leading sire, Bold Ruler. 
Each year, they would breed two meadow broodmares with bold ruler. Then, before the foals were born, they would decide by coin toss who got first choice of the two foals. In 1968, Chenery became ill, and his daughter Penny took charge of the meadow. She chose something royal as one of the mares for breeding to bold ruler. In 1969, Tweedy lost the toin toss with Phipps, who chose the other mare's foil. The meadow kept something royal's yet to be born foil. So basically, from reading that, my understanding really is that they were basically the coin toss was more or less to decide who 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 would keep which female's baby, right? Like so. Yeah. Where, whereas the movie made it seem like the winner just kept the female, period. So uh, a little bit different in reality based on how the how the movie explained it. But getting back to the movie, I mean, I kind of I kind of took it as uh, I guess the way it was said was that like because both of the the female horses were already uh, pregnant at the time, and whoever won the coin toss basically just gets to choose which pick which one they want, right? Yeah, yeah, that's that's how I saw it. I was like, all right, cool. I, I under I got it. Yeah, no, because it, it it was uh, to me it seemed like it, when I watch it, my interpretation from the movie was that they were they were flipping the coin to choose the female. Um, I didn't get the part that they were already pregnant from the movie. So maybe that was just something that I missed picking up on when I watched the movie. So they do the coin toss. Obviously, Ogden Phipps wins, and he has his choice of. Uh, of pick for the for the mares and he chooses the mare hasty matilda which is what penny was ho which was the horse that penny was hoping he would choose because she wanted to uh she wanted something royal we then cut to a scene back in colorado with penny and her kids and husband this is basically just a filler scene for Penny to receive a phone call at home to let her know that the mayor something royal is about to give birth. And then we cut back to a scene at the farm of something royal giving birth to Secretariat. Um, once Secretariat is actually born, both Lucien and the, I guess the farm, I guess his role is as the farmhand. Uh, basically, he, he cleans the horses, feeds them and everything. Eddie. Um, so Lucienne and Eddie both comment on how fast Secretariat stands up after being born. In, in the movie, they show him basically standing up right away. In reality, I don't know how long it took Secretariat to actually stand up. But basically with baby animals, it, it, takes, them, it takes them a while to stand up and get their footing underneath of them for the first time. And in the movie, they're basically showing Secretariat getting up right away with almost no issue. So both Lucien and Eddie point that out. Uh, we then get a very quick montage of Secretariat growing up. Uh, so basically, we cut, we cut from his being born to him being two years old. And then we get another filler scene of Penny back at home with her family, which leads into a scene of them training secretariat to race as Lucien sort of critiques him and finds fault in his racing game and points out what could go wrong what could go right that sort of thing fast forward a bit and we get to see secretariat's first race at aqueduct in new york secretariat finishes fourth this is actually factual in secretariat's first race he did finish fourth and then the next after Secretariat loses. The next scene shows Lucien yelling at the jockey Paul Feliciano after the race and says that Paul is off of Secretariat. And then Lucien turns to Penny and suggests that she hires Ron Turcotte as her jockey instead. This scene is completely made up for the movie because uh, Paul Feliciano actually also rode Secretariat in Secretariat's second race, also at aqueduct in new york and actually ended up winning that race and at the time ron turcott already was the jockey for for the chenneries but he was out at the time due to an injury so that's why feliciano rode secretariat in secretariat's first two races 
But to create a little bit of drama for the movie, they made it seem like uh, Penny and Lucianne basically fired Feliciano after his first race, after he lost on Secretariat, which was not at all factual. And actually, that second race that Feliciano r ran and won Secretariat, won with sec Secretariat, was actually 11 days after the first race. So yeah. it's just because Ron was injured, which is why he wasn't on for the first two races. We then fast forward to a scene of Penny meeting with Ron Turcott. Uh, Ron's first race with Secretariat is at Saratoga, where Secretariat wins. Uh, this is a fact. Secretary uh, won there with Ron as the jockey. We then get an audio montage of Secretary winning more races as it has like a slow motion um, of Secretary crossing the finish line from the first race at Saratoga. And then I believe in the next scene, they bring up the fact that Secretary was seven and four and i'm pretty sure that's incorrect yeah yeah that's definitely incorrect off the top of my head i don't have the numbers as to what secretariat's record was after 11 races but uh i'm fairly certain it was better than seven and four anyways we then are shown penny at the farm talk talking to a couple of reporters uh, they bring up the fact that none of the fathers, or sorry, they bring up the fact that none of the other horses fathered by Bold Ruler, which was Secretary's or Secretariat's father, have had good records running the lengths of a three-year-old racehorse. Because as of right now, Secretariat is in 1972, and he's uh, all these races that we've seen so far in the movie is him racing as a two-year-old horse. And they're basically trying to tell her, well, yeah, he's been doing well as a two-year-old, but historically as a three-year-old, the horses from his father, Bold Ruler, have not done well as three-year-olds because uh, the, the track lengths are longer. They make you run a longer distance. So they're basically pointing that out to her. Um, we then cut to a scene where Secretariat was announced as Horse of the Year for 1972. Uh, this was actually a big deal uh, back in the day because uh, in 1972, Secretariat became just the sixth ever two-year-old horse to win the Horse of the Year award since it had been since it. Had first been given out in 1887 so it was it was quite a rarity for a two-year-old horse back in those days to win horse of the year it's still fairly rare these days as well but a few more have have won as two-year-olds now than what had won at the time but in the middle of them celebrating secretariat's victory as Ho of horse of the year we find out that penny's father has had a stroke uh, there's then a quick scene with Penny with her father at the hospital and then Penny's father passes away and we get a scene with we, we get a scene with Penny, her brother and her husband and Penny's brother Hollis and her husband are trying to convince her to sell Secretariat because of the farm being financially in trouble and with her father no longer around. Uh, they think it would be best to sell Secretariat at his high point uh, as Horse of the Year. They figure that they can get at least $6 million for Secretariat, which would essentially save the farm. Um, and then they could basically, I guess, upgrade the farm and then sell it off. But basically, Secretariat would net them $6 million. And Penny's basically like, well, no. I'm not going to sell Secretariat because she knows that this horse is special, that he's going to do special things. And um, she's pretty convinced that he's going to be able to win the 1973 Triple Crown. So she, she vetoes them because I guess in her dad's will, he had put her brother in charge of the farm and making decisions for the farm but he put penny in charge of making des decisions based on the horses yeah they had uh, she even called in the um 
I guess it's like they're sort of like they're made or something like that. They're they're you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Elizabeth Ham was the name yeah. of the woman, but yeah, I guess you would call her the maid. I'm not exactly sure what her actual role was. Yeah, but they, she she calls her in because Miss um, Ham was the the witness yes. of when uh, her yeah. dad signed the the paper to make her the um, person in charge of the uh, the horses, and then Hollis and the brother were like, well, you know, or the husband were like, well, we could just file an injunction saying he wasn't state of mind, and, and Miss Ham's like, no, no, I was there. He knew exactly what he was doing. Yeah, yeah. So they get all pissed. <laughs> so yeah, so based on that, Penny decides that they're going to keep Secretariat. Before I move on, I don't actually know how accurate that scene was between Penny, her brother, and her father and her husband. We'll get to that at the end, and I'll bring up why I'm not sure how accurate that is. But based on historical accuracy, I don't think it's very accurate. But it's movie accurate. <laughs> they get a lot of things right, but they also get a fair amount of things wrong as well. So I, I, I you, you seem to know a lot more of this than I do because I know absolutely nothing about factual and non-factual things for this movie. Well, I was, <laughs> I, I've basically been watching horse racing since I was about eight or nine years old. My uncle, whose name is also Dave, my uncle Dave was a photographer for the Ontario Jockey Club, which means he, he did a lot of photography at Woodbine, at Fort Erie. A lot of the highway billboards that you used to see back in the 90s and, and 2000s that advertised Woodbine Racetrack, a lot of those were photographs that were taken by him. Um, oh, that's cool. His brother, uh, Rob Landry, was a jockey. I think he still races. I think Rob still races. Uh, so he is a jockey he racing out of Woodbine Racetrack. So I I grew up around racehorsing. So, uh, yeah, I, I've, I tend to know a little bit more about the historical accuracy of, of Secretariat. But, yeah, shout out to Uncle Dave. Good job, Uncle Dave. Uh, <laughs> Great job, Uncle Dave. Uh, we then get a montage of Penny trying to raise money by selling Secretariat's breeding rights because she's coming off of the because Secretariat's coming off of the Horse of the Year accolade and only being two years old. She's trying to cash in early on the breeding rights um, because they she knows that right now. He's going to be high value for the shares of the breeding rights. But a lot of people obviously want to hold off because they want to see how he's going to do as a three-year-old in the big races. So a lot of people balked at, at investing. Now, in real life, there were some people that bought those investments early, whereas the movie basically depicts pretty much everybody saying no to them. But in actuality, some people did invest and take shares in the breeding rights early after that two-year-old uh, season. So after the montage, we get a little bit of a longer scene with Penny meeting with Ogden Phipps once again, trying to get him to buy into Secretariat's breeding rights. And Ogden counter offers to buy Secretariat outright for $7 million. Penny turns him down. He then ups his offer to $8 million. She turns him down again, basically saying that she has faith that that Secretariat is going to win the Triple Crown. So she refuses. We then fast forward a couple of scenes and... Or sorry, no, the very next scene is Penny at home watching TV. And we see the trainer of Sham, who's going to be Secretariat's main rival... Uh, we see the the trainer of Sham Poncho, which is a great name. I love that name. Uh, and he, he he's on TV talking about how better Sham is than Secretariat, basically sowing the seeds for the feud. From what I could find out, there wasn't anything actually like that. Like Sham's trainer wasn't uh, Poncho wasn't as abrasive or insulting in real life as this movie depicts him to be, but basically you you need a villain in the movie right um yeah. although it is factual that that sham was 
Secretariat's main rival in 1973 because as good as Secretariat was, Sham was just as good, but he wasn't getting the attention because at the time in the 70s, if you were on the East Coast, which Secretariat was, uh, Secretariat was racing out of the East Coast, so he was racing in uh, like Baltimore, New York, those sorts of places. So he was getting more attention, whereas the West Coast, which is actually where Sham had been racing for most of 1972, at that point in time was sort of shut out. Like, it didn't get as much recognition as it does today. The East Coast still tends to get more focus today, but uh, definitely back, back in the 70s, the West was basically just an afterthought. So... Basically, Sham and Secretariat really did come down to an East Coast-West Coast rivalry. With the West Coast thinking that Sham was the better horse, and the East Coast thinking that Secretariat was the better horse. So, after, after Penny sees Poncho basically talking shit on TV, um, we then go to Secretariat's first race against Sham at the Wood Memorial, which took place... On April 21st, 1973, the movie really makes it seem like Sham won this race, but in reality, Sham actually finished second, and then Secretariat finished third. The actual winner of the Wood Memorial was a horse named Angle Light, who would also go on to run in the um, Kentucky Derby and Preakness. But it was Angle Light that won won the race, but the movie makes it seem like Sham was the big winner, even though Sham came in second. After the race, Penny chewed out both Ron and Lucien for Secretariat losing the race. Now, in actuality, I don't know if Penny chewed either of those guys out after losing the race or not. Of course, it was a big race at the time. It was basically the first bi big race for, for Secretariat against Sham, as I already mentioned. Um, and he ended up placing third. So the movie shows Penny basically yelling at Ron and Lucien for Secretariat not doing well. And then we get a scene where a vet is looking at Secretariat. And it turns out that uh, Secretariat had an abscess. And the abscess is what was causing Secretariat um, pain and causing the poor performance and not running properly. Uh, we then get shown Penny apologizing to Ronnie and Lucien for basically chewing them out when it was an injury that caused the poor performance. We then get a storyline set up for the Kentucky Derby, and Lucien basically tells Penny to deal with the press leading up to the Derby so that Lucien and Eddie can work on Secretariat and work on getting Secretariat healthy without people knowing that he has an issue, although as it progresses and as the reporters and stuff and people and fans aren't seeing Secretariat train, people obviously are figuring out that something is wrong. But basically, they never come out and say what's wrong with Secretariat. So they, they show a scene with two of the reporters and they're basically speculating on the injury. They're saying that they've heard it was like bone spurs, uh, uh, hurt ankle, all sorts of different rumors that they had heard flying around. Um, but basically, Penny, Lucienne, and Eddie are doing their best to keep everybody in the dark and not giving any information on Secretariat or his condition. That takes us into the Kentucky Derby press conference, where it's just Poncho and Penny uh, and Lucienne. Basically, again, the movie shows... Poncho just being this braggadocious, obnoxious dickhead, <laughs> um, talking about how, you know, Secretariat isn't as good as Sham, how Penny is just a, a housewife, and basically she has no business in horse racing, that sort of stuff. And then we get a montage of uh, Ronnie Turcotte test running Secretariat and Eddie and Lucienne trying to nurse him back to health. And then finally, Lucienne starts to question if they should actually run Secretariat in the Kentucky Derby. This leads Penny to have a moment alone with Secretariat, sort of like a telepathic moment where she just puts her hand on her head and like looks him in the eyes. 
and then basically says, okay, then, and decides that he's good to go and they're still going to race him in the Derby. We get a very quick scene of the Kentucky Derby early in the morning before the race actually gets underway. And it's basically just showing that Secretary is finally healthy again. He's eating all of his food. And then Eddie just goes out and celebrates. And I just love this scene. Uh, it was a really, really good scene for, for Eddie. I thought Eddie was a great character in this film that I would have liked to have seen more of. But again, like the focus obviously isn't on Eddie. It's on Penny, the horse, the trainer, and the jockey. So, yeah, because one of the things was he wasn't eating at all, right? Because of yeah, the abscess. Because of the abscess. Because the abscess. He wasn't. I, I'm not sure if the abscess was on his mouth or on his tooth, but it was somewhere in the mouth region. Yeah. So he wasn't eating or anything, and then even even when that that race that they that he lost came in fourth, um, was it the 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 jockey had said he didn't even sound like he was breathing properly as all right because he said like, usually sounds like an engine and he was just not going yeah like ron could tell that there was something wrong with him yeah and that's when they found the abscess and stuff but uh yeah so when after he has that moment with penny they take him to the stable and he starts eating and yeah like you said eddie just is super happy screaming whoever kentucky get ready because you're about to see something special yeah. nobody's nobody's there but he's having that yeah he's just yelling it's, it's a great yeah. fun yeah. scene and i would have liked to have seen more more of that from from eddie in this movie yeah. but Again, yeah. he's not one of the main focuses of the movie, so I get it. But it was a nice little scene for that character to have. So we then finally get to the Kentucky Derby race itself, which Secretariat ends up winning, obviously. I can't remember if they mentioned in the movie or not, but in reality, Secretariat set the record for the fastest run race at the Kentucky Derby. And 47 years later, his record for the fastest time still exists. Nobody nobody has touched his record in 47 years. So, yeah, not only do, does that. he win the Derby, but he sets the record for fastest finish in a Derby. We then cut to Penny's family at home watching the second leg of the Triple Crown, which is the Preakness. And it shows it on TV. And I think they used actual footage from the Preakness for this. I could be wrong, but it looked like they actually used the actual footage from, from the uh, Preakness with footage of Diane Lane and John Malkovich intercut with it. Um, cool. But so they show Penny's family at home watching the Preakness. Again, Secretariat wins. Again, not mentioned in the movie, but... Secretariat sets the record for fastest victory at the Preakness, which again, 47 years later, still stands, has not been broken. We then get to a scene of Lucienne talking to Penny and discussing on how they should train Secret Secretariat going into the Belmont Stakes. Basically, should they push him harder or should they give him a little bit of rest? And it's decided upon that they should just push him to his limits. We then get another press conference with Penny and Poncho. And Poncho is basically guaranteeing that Sham's going to win the, the Belmont Stakes. And he talks about how, you know, yeah, uh, no, one, no one wants to discuss the fact that Sham had the second quickest times in history in both the Belmont or sorry in both the Preakness and the Kentucky Derby which is true which is true Sham had the second fastest times in history at the Preakness and at the Kentucky. at the Kentucky Derby and then basically Penny humiliates him by pointing pointing that out basically saying something along the lines of you're right your horse does have the second fastest time basically yeah. pointing out that you know uh secretariat still still first still holds the records i, I it, it was a great burn absolutely a, amazing burn 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 i'm just i'm i'm just picturing kelso right now from that 70s show burn <laughs> <laughs>
But that leads to Poncho getting pissed off and walking out on the press conference. And then he talks to, I'm not sure who it was. It wasn't really made clear. I don't know if it was like the jockey or the farmhand for Sham. But he he talks to somebody and he basically says that on race day, they're going to force Sham to push Secretariat until Secretariat breaks. We then get clips of Secretariat training. Uh, There's a scene at the Belmont Ball, uh, which is like a little gala uh, before the big race. We then get to race day, and we see Sham's Sham's jockey, and I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, Lafette Pinke Jr. I can't, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that properly or not, but he basically tells Ron that Ron is going to eat dirt against Sham. And then Poncho put, pulls Lafette aside and tells him to go hard for the lead and draw Secretariat up close. Uh, basically trying to force Secretariat into the lead so that Secretariat tires himself out and Sham can win the race easier. This is actually inaccurate. Again, another inaccuracy. Lafette was never told to pull Secretariat into the lead and force him to run faster. What Lafette was told was to keep pace with Secretariat because in both the Kentucky Derby and the Preakness, basically Secretariat started off slow, like he was back of the pack. The movie shows him last in both races. In reality, he was like, I think, third from last in both races when he started off. And then he ended up picking it up at the end to win both races. So in actuality, Lafette was basically told to keep pace with Secretariat. So if Secretariat starts off slow, Sham was supposed to start off slow. If Secretariat started off fast, Sham was supposed to keep up and keep pace with him. So he was never told to push Secretariat. He was told to keep pace with Secretariat. So we then get to the race itself. Secretariat wins the race by a wide margin. Yeah, it was like 11 lengths or something like that, right? Oh, much larger. It was 31 lengths. Oh shit! Uh, and he also he also finished the race, which is which was a mile and a half. It was a mile and a half race. He finished it in two minutes twenty four seconds flat. So both his margin of victory and his time of victory again records, which still stand to this day forty seven years later. I don't think I don't think anyone's ever going to eclipse that 31 lengths margin of victory. We might get somebody break 224 flat, but it's going to be tough. The closest any horse has gotten to that since was the Belmont winner in I believe 1986. I could be wrong on the year, but one of one of the years after Secretariat, the one of the Belmont winners ran the race in 226 flat so the closest anyone's gotten was like two seconds uh, away from secretariat so it's going to be really really hard but so there were accuracies in this race and inaccuracies so obviously the the part where it shows um secretariat and sham going neck and neck and everybody else lagging behind that was historically accurate both sham and Secretariat were basically the one-two horse for the majority of the race, and then in the back, halfway through the back stretch, Secretariat just pulled ahead and never looked back. And that's where you hear the announcer Chick Anderson uh, make the call: Secretariat is moving like a tremendous machine, which, in, which in my opinion, is one of the greatest sports calls in history. It. it it, it was a fantastic call. I get shivers every time I watch the Belmont and hear that call. But oh, Is this something you can actually watch somewhere? Yes. Oh. So, but in the movie, they made, uh, they made the announcer, Chick Anderson, as he was announcing the race, they basically made him narrate it as if, secre- as, as if Sham was bringing the race to Secretariat and pushing Secretariat to his limit. In actuality, obviously, Chick Anderson was a professional and he would never narrate or manipulate his story. He just called the race as he saw it. So things like saying, 
like in the movie where it says something along the lines of Sham is really pushing Secretariat and forcing him to his limit. Obviously, that was never said. Chick just called the race as he saw it. So the way they had the race announced in the movie is inaccurate. They also, at the end, when Secretariat wins the race, they uh, they have Chick Anderson say that Secretariat has won by 31 lengths, which is the accurate number of lengths Secretariat won by. He did win by 31 lengths, but at the time of the race, like, it was so, like, the victory was so wide, no one really knew how big of a margin of victory Secretariat had won by, and in actuality, Chick Anderson, in the real race, estimated that it was 25 lengths. It ended up being 31, but he estimated 25, which doesn't get shown in the movie. Now, I'm going to try something, and I don't know if it's going to work, so give me one sec. Two extras in case of difficulty, and you will see really Secretary being led. He is... Number I'm sorry, is two, the video he is going to lag uh, a little bit because I have some coming in after him right is now. Uh, Private Smiles, the with the distinguished Whitney colors. Most of these are quiet horses. The starters have handled almost all of them. They don't anticipate any trouble. And as this third horse goes in, I give it up to Chick Anderson, who will call the race for you. Thanks, Woody. The horse is continuing to move into the gate. Here's the one horse that caused a bit of trouble in the Derby. Twice a prince, but he appears to be going in fine today. Yes, he's in him well. And Sham now going in. He's the outside horse, and we're ready to go for this tremendous Belmont stick. Everybody's in line, and they're off. So Sham's on the outside, Secretary on, on yes, the Yes, Mike rail. Allen going for the lead with twice a prince on the outside. Secretary to weigh very well, has good position on the rail, and in fact is now going up with the leader. They're moving for the first turn. It is Secretariat. Sham on the outside is also moving along strongly. And now it's Sham. Sham and Secretariat are right together into the first turn. Mike Allen has third behind them. Then it's twice a prince, and the trailer is private smiles as they go by the turn. Those two together, Sham on the outside. Sham getting ahead in front as they move around the turn with Secretariat second. Then there's a large gap. Make it eight lengths back to Mike Allen in third and Vice of Prince fourth. And Private Smiles is still the trailer. They're on the back stretch. It's almost a match race now. Secretariat's on the inside by a head. Sham is on the outside. They've opened 10 lengths on Mike Gallon, who is third by a head, with Vice of Prince fourth. Then it's another eight lengths back to Private Smiles, who is trailing the field. They continue down the back stretch, and that's Secretariat not taking the lead. He's got it by about a length and a half. Still Sham, 10 lengths back, Mike Gallon, Vice of Prince. They're moving on the turn now. For the turn at Secretariat, it looks like he's opening. The lead is increasing. Make it three, three and a half. He's moving into the turn. Secretariat holding on to a large lead. Dan is second, and then it's a long way back to Mike Allen and twice a print. They're on the turn. It's Secretariat is blazing along the first three quarters of a mile in 109 and four fifths. Secretariat is widening now. He is moving like a tremendous machine. Secretariat by 12. Secretariat by 14 lengths on the turn. Sham is dropping back. It looks like they'll catch him today as Mike Allen and Vice of Prince are both coming up to him now. But Secretariat is all alone. He's out there almost a sixteenth of a mile away from the rest of the horses. Secretariat is in a position that seems impossible to catch. He's into the stretch. Secretariat leads his field by 18 lengths. And now Vice of Prince has taken second. And Mike Allen has moved back to third. They're in the stretch. Secretariat has opened a 22-length lead. He is going to be the Triple Crown winner. Here comes Secretariat to the wire. An unbelievable, an amazing performance. He hits the finish 25 lengths in front. It's going to be twice a first second. Mike Allen third, Private Smiles fourth, and Sam, who had it today, dropped back to fifth. So that's the real Penny, Chenery, and Lucien uh, on the screen right now. She and Lucien Lawrence, who own this most magnificent animal, who has today run the most sensational Belmont stake in the history of this race. Secretariat has accomplished the unbelievable task 
of breaking the mile and a half record by two and three fifths seconds. That is a record that may stand forever. The time of this race, 2.24. Almost unbelievable. At that point, I said 25. It could conceivably have been more. The time of this race, I must tell you again, an unbelievable 2.24, two and three fifths seconds, the record. Unbelievable is all you're hearing down here. The winner's circle and this horse. That was the actual Belmont Stakes race. And as you can tell, obviously, Chick Anderson didn't call it as like uh, a narration of sham trying to push Secretary. He just called the race as he saw it. And yeah. as I pointed out, he does say that Secretary won by 25 lengths. And then after the break, he said conceivably it could be more than 25 lengths he was just basically estimating yeah that yeah because it ended up being 31 yeah it, it, they ended up it, it ended up being 31 but yeah at the time no one had seen a race with that type of margin of victory before so so before we wrap up i do want to point out some other inaccuracies with the movie so at the end of the movie, they're giving like little details on all the people, all the main people from the movie. So Elizabeth Ham, Eddie, Lucien, Ron, everybody involved, right? Yeah. So they Secretary say that himself. I'm sorry. Does yeah, the Secretary himself. Yeah. So they say that Penny saved her family and her farm, and they implied that it was due to Secretariat. In reality, this is actually inaccurate. In reality, Penny ended up having an affair with Lucien, and she divorced her husband in late 1973. So, technically, she didn't save her family. <laughs> <laughs> and also, her farm was also saved the previous year, 1972, uh, during Secretariat's basically debut year but mm -hmm. the the Cheneries also had another horse named Riva Ridge who almost won the Triple Crown in 1972 uh, Riva Ridge won the Kentucky Derby and the Belmont Stakes but missed out on winning the Preakness so uh, did not end up winning the Triple Crown in 1972 but because of how well Riva Ridge did in 1972 and add to that how well Secretariat did it as a two-year-old in 1972 basically her farm and everything was saved in that year which mm -hmm. the movie doesn't touch on they don't even mention Riva, uh, Riva Ridge once in this movie no so over over the course of her career or sorry over the course of his career because Riva Ridge was a male horse as well uh, Riva won 17 races, or yeah, had 17 wins over the course of 30 races. Meanwhile, Secretariat had 16 wins in 21 races, which is unprecedented. Like a 762 winning percentage, that's just beyond unprecedented. And in the races he didn't win, I think he ended up, if I remember correctly, he finished second twice and third once so he ended up having 19 uh 19 showings where you know he made some sort of money for win place show so 19 out of 21 races where you're making money that's that is beyond ridiculous that that's incredible secretariat's final race was actually a victory here in toronto at woodbine racetrack on october 28th 1973 Eddie Maple was actually the jockey for that race, as Ron had been suspended a couple days earlier for quote-unquote careless riding of another horse. So, unfortunately, Ron, Turco Ron Turcotte did not get to race Secretariat in Secretariat's final race, which is kind of a blow because Eddie was at, or sorry, not Eddie, Ron was actually Canadian, so I know it probably would have meant a lot to Ron to win or to race Secretariat in Canada for his final race. But unfortunately, that was not the case. I do find it funny, though, that 
the Canadian jockey Ron basically rode Secretariat for his entire career in the U.S. And then it was a U.S. jockey that rode Secretariat for his final race in Canada. I just find that a little bit funny. <laughs> Secretariat would end up siring. That means basically being being the father to 600 horses, as the movie points out at the end. Uh, two of those horses were Lady Secret, which was the 1986 Horse of the Year, which was a big deal because female horses very rarely win Horse of the Year. It's like Secretariat winning it as a two-year-old. By the way, they didn't mention it in this movie, but Secretariat also won Horse of the Year in 1973. So he did win Horse of the Year in back-to-back -back years. But, uh, so he sired Lady, uh, Lady Secret, the 1986 Horse of the Year, and Risen Star, who again just fell one rate, one victory short of a triple crown. Uh, Risen Star could not win the Kentucky Derby in 1988, but he did win the 1988 Preakness and Belmont. So Secretariat had some good lineage, had some left some good lineage behind. So, but I mean, we are at an hour and ten minutes. I was not expecting to go that long. <laughs> but Josh, before we wrap up, what are your final thoughts on the movie? Uh, I thought the movie was really well done. Uh, again, I'm not, I wasn't the biggest, I didn't know anything about this movie. Nothing about it. Uh, I know nothing about horse racing. <laughs> Never, I don't think I've ever seen one, to be honest. We're going to get you to um, a horse race at some point. Uh, all right, sounds good. But uh, yeah, no, the, mo the movie was good. I, I thought it was, I don't know, it was, it was, I enjoyed it more than I thought I would. It's not something that I thought I was going to like before. Oh, and, and I, somebody else I knew in that was one of the older daughter. She's yeah, actually, yeah, uh, I can't remember if it was AJ Michaela or Ali Michaela. It was AJ. Yeah. Yeah. It was AJ. I, I knew was... you, I knew you would enjoy that. <laughs> how did you, how, why would you say that? <laughs> Just a lucky guess. I mean, she, she's, she's, uh, another Disney thing. She's had her own movie. Her and her sister had a movie. I've actually seen her before. Didn't her, they have a TV yeah. show, Ali and AJ? No, so Ali was on the Phil of the Future show. AJ, they just had their own movie called, like, the two, the two of them were, it was called Cowbells. Okay. Other than that, I mean, AJ's been on, like, a ton of different things. So they both got on to be on, like, tons of different shows. Like, recently I can think of Ali or AJ being on uh, The Goldbergs. Okay. And Ali recently on iZombie. Okay. Uh, but yeah, they they also do they also sing a lot too. So like, like two years ago, two three years ago, Ava and I actually went and saw them perform here in Toronto. That was pretty cool. Very nice, yeah. very nice. Yeah. So if you had to give this movie a rating out of ten, what would you give it? Uh, I'd give it a seven. I'd give it a solid seven. It was good. Overall, I'm gonna give it a six. I'm gonna give it a seven as a standalone as just like a disney insp inspirational type movie i'll give it a seven but based on the historical inaccuracies i'm only going to give that about a five so overall i'm going to rate it a, a six out of ten. Six out of ten wow that's is that not what did, what did you give descendants was descendants a six descendants descendants was a five brought oh. down because of the security scene Oh, so close. <laughs> so close. I know. I know. <laughs> th th this one was a seven brought down because of the historical inaccuracies. So wait, what, 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 was, uh, what was National Treasure again? National Treasure, I think, was a seven. Seven? Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start writing these down so, we can, so I can keep score of what you say, Dave. <laughs> but that's going to do it for this edition of the Ocho and Ortiz Disney podcast. We are at about an hour and 15 minutes, which is a lot longer than I was anticipating going. As always, guys, you can find us on social medias. Uh, you can find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash Ocho and Ortiz Disney pod, Instagram at Ocho and Ortiz Disney pod. We're still working on getting the Twitter back up and running, uh, but you can also find us on most major podcasts and platforms. Google Play, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and of course our main source of uploading is Podbean. 
Ocho and Ortiz Disney Pod dot Podbean dot com. I'm still working on getting merch. That's not ready yet. Hopefully by the time this episode actually comes out, it'll be ready. I know I've been saying that for the last couple of episodes, but yeah, Ho- hopefully soon. Hopefully not too much more of a wait. And uh, you know what, guys? If you if you enjoy what we do. Please share this video, share this podcast, give it a like, subscribe to our channel, follow us on social medias. It definitely helps out more than you know. Uh, We'd love to interact with you, so please feel free to leave comments as well if you think there's anything that we can improve upon, if there's anything that you'd like to see more of. Just please, any comments you leave, make them respectful. We We will absolutely gladly take constructive criticism. But please don't just criticize to be a troll. Um, Having said that, guys, whether you're listening to this in the morning, the afternoon, the evening, whatever time of day, where it is, when you're listening to this, we thank you for listening. We appreciate you listening. And we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.